We have been talking for, this is my third week, final week, on an incredible message called Processed Christianity. A few weeks ago, my wife was sharing with me, she's been doing tremendous research on health and nutrition, and my wife is, doesn't go by internet rumors, she only goes by confirmed studies. And it's discovered many things. We've shared here how in the 1950s, General Mills wanted to get people hooked on their processed foods. And so they did a number of things, including they took over the home ec teaching in schools to teach students how to use their processed foods when home ec was originally designed to keep people learning how to cook real food. And we've seen the byproduct and the result of processed foods, and I'm not trying to get on a uh, 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 well, yeah, I am. It done killing us. It's given us heart disease. It's given us Alzheimer's. It's given us all kinds of just junk. It's destroying our bodies. And yet it, it's so easily accessible. In fact, it's hard not to get processed foods. Come on. I mean, it's in there. They touch everything. I, I, in fact, I was just... Uh, we're going to deal with some of this today, but I was down at uh, uh, Golden Corral last week. I've been changing. I'm on this transitional part of my diet, and and so I got to stabilize. And 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 it's a tough part of my diet. I get to eat all the meat I want. So I like that. So I went down to Golden Corral and had me some steak. And then I wanted to see what the calories were and the fat in the steak. And I went in there, and then in big bold letters on the steak, it tells me my steak has been infused with soy and with wheat. And I said, you put, well, how'd you get soy and wheat in my steak? I thought I was having a pure steak. And for, for those of you that don't know it, soy is no good for you. Soy sauce is fine because it's fermented, but soy itself is a mess. And so we started seeing all these uh, things. And General Mills, in their marketing campaign, to get us on to processed foods, they sold us on four things. Number one, tell every, convince everybody it's easy, it's fast, it's cheap, and it's tasty. Everybody say easy. Say fast. Say cheap. Say it's tasty. And when my wife shared that with me, it just exploded inside of me. My Lord, that's modern American church. We've been preaching the gospel and we say, hey, 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 hey it's easy. It's fast, in and out, 55 minutes, ching, ching. It's cheap. There isn't much of a price. And we're going to make sure it's tasty. We dealt with the last two weeks really powerfully that real Christianity isn't always easy. Hello, somebody. Come on, I don't know. Oh, come to Jesus. Everything will be fine. Come to Jesus. All hell's going to break loose. What are you talking about? And I mean literally. I'm not cussing. Come on. It's not easy. And real Christianity isn't fast. I mean, we want to pray and it all be answered tomorrow. But God has this thing called the process of making a saint. And between your prayer and your answer, he's making you a saint. Huh? He ain't a spiritual ATM. Come on, amen. The other two things is they make it, they say it's cheap and it's tasty. Now, how do they make it cheap? How do they make processed food cheap? They add fillers. In fact, back in my drug days, for those of you that don't know, I used to have drug days. Back in my drug days when I was doing a little bit of dealing, we would take the drugs we got and then we would add filler. It's called cutting. So it would be more than what it was, but it always lowered the potency of it, but we still charge the same amount for it. And in, in processed food, they add a lot of fillers. Y'all ever go to, I'm going to get in trouble. Y'all ever go to buy Walmart food, meat, and you put it in a skillet, and it fills up with water? Am I talking to anybody here? You say, where all that come from? Filler. They don't, they injected it. So they can charge you for the weight of the water. It ain't no three pounds of chicken. It's two pounds of chicken and one pound of water. And soy. And wheat. Ta 
Taco Bell finally came out and admitted that their beef tacos ain't really all beef. There's a bunch of filler. That's how they make it cheap, because they put in cheap filler. The problem with cheap filler is it has no nutritional value. And that most of it's against you. Most of it wears on you. Not only did they put it in to make it filler for, for cheap and put stuff that has no nutritional value, they also, in order to make it tasty, they add a lot of flavor. They add a lot of sugar. They add artificial sweeteners. That aspartame stuff doesn't make you dumb. No, literally, it causes people to lose their memory. It causes all kinds. It turns the formaldehyde in your body. You're walking around. You didn't realize you're a walking around dead person. Am I, boy, I'm getting some people all upset right now. But do you know, but, but see, you know why they put in the sugar? You know why they put in the stuff? Because it's addictive. We're, we're, we're a bunch of sugar addicts in America. We are addicted. They took the fat out of the food and they put sugar in and you became more addicted because we thought the fat was the problem but really the most of the fat wasn't the problem it's the sugar that's the problem and that's what we've done in the church we've done taking the oil out come on we said the oil is what's making the, the church weak the oil never made the church weak it's the sugar make it taste sweet and then back in 1984, they started adding, you don't know this, but you're going to know it now. They started adding a chemical to the wheat in America. That chemical makes you want to eat more. That chemical causes you. We wonder why so many of us are overweight. Over 60% of the American population is overweight because we're addicted to food. Because they put stuff in our food that has made us addicted. Are y'all hearing me? And it's amazing because once 1984, they started adding this to the wheat. And you can do the research and find this out. That made you addicted. It's not just bread products. But they started adding wheat fillers to almost everything that wheat fillers never used to be in. So that you became addicted to all kinds of processed food. Y'all hear me? Someone said the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. That's why there's so many people that are gluten intolerant now. Why they changed the, the, the wheat we eat today isn't the wheat they ate back then in Jesus' time. They done changed it. They genetically modified it. They had added chemicals to it. And it makes it addicted. And it's causing all kinds of problems. And I said that's exactly what's happening in the church. The only way we made the, we made the church, we made Christianity easy. We, made it, we told everybody it's fast. We said it's cheap. The only way you make Christianity cheap is you got to add a lot of filler. You got to sprinkle it with a bunch of sugar. And you got to make sure people are addicted to that new form of Christianity so they won't go for the real deal. Hello, somebody. So I thought to myself, why don't we actually look to Jesus? Just, just, I mean, God forbid we read more than one verse in a service. I preached 86, services, 86 verses last Tuesday. Someone came up to me and said, you just preached worth a year and a half in some churches. It's true. So can we actually look at the words of Jesus and see it for what he says? What does it mean to be a real follower of Christ? Someone say, I want to be a real follower. Maybe, well, maybe now you're all nervous. You don't know. Come on. No, you're all good. Come on. How many want to be a real follower of Christ? How many don't want to be a part of the Christian club but want to be a follower of Jesus? All right, Luke chapter 9, verse, beginning with verse 57. Let's read this. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. How many ever prayed that prayer? Oh, Lord, especially in the heat of the emotion of the moment. Of the Holy Ghost service and the feel the presence of God and the worship was great. And Ashley was tearing it up and, 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 and the preaching was good. And you say, oh God, I surrender. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And I love Jesus. Because Jesus just, he was never begging for followers. He was not trying to find and create an environment that was easy for people to join his little following. Oh, come, come on. 
So Jesus turned and he didn't say, hallelujah, glory to God, we got another church member. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We're going to get in that in a moment. Then he said to another, then Jesus said to another, follow me. But he said, he's trying to negotiate. Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus, with the kindness and compassion of someone from Texas, <laughs> and deep cultural sensitivities to the value of family, said, let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Hello. Jesus was a cult leader. I'm just saying, it's just there. Don't get mad at me, it's all in red. Jesus was really serious. And another said, and another also said, this all, they're all traveling together. They're hearing each other's responses. Lord, I will follow you, but, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> let me go first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no, <laughs> no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Some people imagine that, imagine that the ministry of, G, of the Lord Jesus was a frantic quest for followers. But these verses review, refute that view. Jesus would accept anyone who would come to him on his terms. He would not make discipleship sound attractive to the flesh. Come on, somebody. He did not mislead people into a rosary view, a rosy view of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. He didn't try to ease him in. Oh, no, it's, so, it's, so, it's really, it's not bad. It's easy. It's just lovey-dovey, gushy-wushy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, when you get deep enough, we'll kind of unveil and show you the real, what, what the real deal is. Isn't that amazing? The concept is what we do. In fact, there's a major, major, big, huge church in Dallas-Fort Worth that teaches other pre preachers. They say, do not tell the people when they come to your church what you really believe. Get them in, get them hooked, and then show them what you really believe. If you did that to me, I think you were a deceiver. Come on, ladies. Do you want some guy who will present himself as he's not really in order to win your heart? Then once he's got your heart, say, well, let me tell you who I really am. See, we're so afraid if we present Jesus and real Christianity that people won't actually follow him. So we have, to, we have to deny who he really is, deny what he, it's really about, because we're so afraid. We're trying to win him in the flesh and make it appealing to the flesh to get him in. And then if we get him hooked strong enough, then they'll go ahead and maybe surrender more. How little trust do we have? Man, I can't help but think about this dear, precious saint, this woman that was in, this, in uh, um, uh, the Sudan. Was it Sudan? She was arrested, sentenced, this just happened just now, sentenced to death because she would and told you either deny Christianity or you're going to die. She was pregnant. She went into the prison, pregnant, being threatened, known she's going, she's in line for execution, gives birth to her child in prison. Are y'all hearing me? And this woman, she is a modern-day hero. Come on. This woman would not deny Jesus. Facing death and facing unknown certain future for her child. But she gave birth to her child in prison. And she stood strong and she stood faithful while America stand, but stood by the government. Well, I'm just telling you. Come on, Christians right now in Iraq are being killed, are being beheaded right now by the, by the hundreds. Do you understand? It's happening right now, but we're being quiet about it. God forbid. Well, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble. 
God forbid anybody, anybody touch a Koran wrong, we're going to have a, a major blowout. But you let, let a bunch of Christians be murdered. And well, well, we just want to. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just. Someone say the devil's a liar. Shakara Mashande. This gospel will offend. I said this gospel will offend. Now we've got to understand the context of what was going on here. Jesus, in, in chapter 9, let me read a couple of verses, just a few verses earlier. Jesus was laying out something. You have to understand the context in which they were saying they're going to be a follower. In Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 20. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. Isn't it amazing Jesus wasn't after about fame and fortune? Isn't it amazing Jesus was never about, oh, tell everybody who I am. Because his trust was never in the manipulation of man. His trust was always in the work of the Spirit of God. Saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. All right? So he's laying out, hey, my future isn't exactly rosy. Then in verse 43, but while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to them, let these words sink down into your ears. Okay, I know I already told you a few verses back you didn't get it. So let me tell you again. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of man. Now you really want to follow me? But they did not understand this saying. Isn't it amazing how much Jesus can talk, tell us we can read scriptures and we just don't get it? All right. Anybody help me out here? All right. But they did not understand this saying. And it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about what about this saying. And then verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So here is Jesus focused on going to Jerusalem. He's been telling them, when I get there, they're going to betray me. They're going to turn me over. They're going to kill me. I'm going to suffer. Now, he just finished telling him that. And this one man, the first man, it tells us in Matthew's translation, he's a scribe. He's one of the religious leaders. And he's so wowed by the teaching of Jesus, he's probably so enamored by the miracles of Jesus that he presumptuously runs up and says, Hey, hey, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, knowing his heart, says... Foxes have holes, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He says, if you're really willing to follow me, are you willing to lose the comforts of stability? Because if you're going to be a follower of me, you're not going to be able to. See, I know you're a scribe. You're probably thinking I'm the next great religious wave. You're probably trying to join my club. So that you get to be a part of the leadership. But I'm telling you, we're not going to take over the mansions. We're not going to take over the castle. We're not going to take over the temple. You're going to follow me. You're probably going to be homeless. Hello, somebody. Are you willing to lose your home? You know why? Because I don't have a home here. My home is in heaven. My home is in here. I'm not setting down roots here. I'm focused on something up there. See, true followers, someone say a follower. True followers, the Lord said to me, the true followers will put my kingdom before their comforts. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm going to say that again because that's just really good. In fact, say that after me. Say, true followers will put his kingdom before my comforts. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. 
Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruin? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Stop. This is what, now, let, let, now, now, someone say it's the words of Jesus. It ain't processed Christianity. See, processed Christianity will allow you to pay a little bit of money and hire people to be spiritual for you. Oh, my God, that's good. Come on. We get to hire the preacher who will pray and hear from God. We get to hire some worship leaders who will seek God and write some songs and, 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 and bring the presence of God. So we can just show up, pay no price, and enjoy the fruit of somebody else's labor. The problem is that doesn't feed you. Woo! Karabo Shande. This is what God says. Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. How many want God to be glorified? He says, put me first. You're going to follow me? Are you willing to let go of your comforts? Let me tell you something, I've flown over three million miles. People sometimes ask me, oh, isn't, it so, isn't that so glorious to be able to travel the nations of the world? <laughs> Do you know how many hours? I used to calculate it up. I was traveling so much that if you took just the time I was on airplanes and in airports, just that, and squeezed those hours together, I was on airplanes or in airports anywhere between 45 and 50 days. 24 hours solid periods in a row every year. And for years, I couldn't sleep on a plane. I remember being on planes, heading overseas somewhere, so exhausted, having been up. Some of the times my travel was 44 hours straight. Traveling, having not slept for days, stuck in those little seats in between two very well-blessed people. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And I was pretty blessed at the time, too, so. We looked like a pot of Cinnabons, just. <laughs> Help me, Lord. I remember sitting there in the middle of the night. So uncomfortable, so in pain, actually pain, because I was so uncomfortable and I was so tired and I couldn't sleep. Tears just running down my face. And people say, why would you keep going? Because he said, go. You know, I even had some Amer American Christians, because we think so wrong. Well, if the Lord really called you to go there, then he would have given you the grace. You'd be able to rest on planes. If God really called you, he would take care of all those things. Where did we get that concept from? He did give me grace. I didn't die. But am I only going to go because I have comfort? Am I only going to go overseas because they buy me a business class ticket and put me up in a fine hotel? Am I only going to go because I get to do it on my schedule? I don't, I don't see that in the early church. Jesus said, hey, you want to follow me? You might be homeless. You're going to lose the comforts and the security of this life. And then right from there, right from there, now Jesus, having just corrected this one guy and laying out what the cost is, hey, you're welcome, but you got to be willing to let go of all your comforts. Jesus then turns to somebody else. He says, hey, I'm calling you out. Follow me. Someone say, follow me. Man, what it is like to receive the call of God. Shh, follow me. Hallelujah. I remember May 4th, 1986. I got saved May 2nd, 1986. May 4th, 1986. While on my knees, after having repented of unforgiveness towards my stepmother, because they preached an incredible message on forgiveness, and I forgave. And there on my knees, only saved two days. 
Amazing. Some people serve God for 20 years can never get on their knees. But I was only saved two days on my knees worshiping God with my hands raised. And the Lord began to show me. I saw all my plans of my life laid out before me. And God spoke to me and he said, I've called you to preach my gospel. And I said, yes, Lord, I will. And immediately I saw all my dreams literally go off into the distance. And right there without even knowing what it was, God gloriously baptized me in the Holy Ghost. And I started speaking in a heavenly language. Woo! That's why nobody can talk me out of tongues. Because I got it before I knew what it was. He said, follow me. No matter what, I said, Lord, I'll follow you. He called me. And many of you in this building, you have felt the call of God. He said, follow me. But what kind of like this guy? Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, the reality is this man's dad wasn't dead yet. If he was, he would have already been there burying him. You have to understand the culture. This dad, man was probably getting near death. And it, why would he, he said, but, and you think, oh, I just need to be there for my family. Now, you understand how Jesus is so not typical cultural? I got news for you. Jesus was rarely culturally relevant. He never bowed down to the culture. Well, you know, I mean, back then, you, I mean, you think family's huge in Texas. You should see back then. Back, back then, they didn't have families. They had tribes. And I'm not being negative on family. I, I, we honor family, amen? amen? And when we don't put ministry above family, we, we, have, we have our priorities straight. Come on, amen? But, but here, you have to understand, the reason it was important for him to be there is because when the father died, that's when the inheritances were divvied out. So he said, now, Jesus, I'll follow you. But see, my dad's got some money. And if I hang out just a little while and shore up my financial situation, then I'll have the provision I need to go do what you want me to do. And how many believers in America, God called you to do something, and you spend most of your time trying to figure out and get the finances all lined up first. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. I can't tell you how many young people have told me God has called them in the mission field or God has called, well, I'm going to go start this business. Or I'm, and I'm not saying that God will never have you do that, but I'll go do this, I'll go do that, and then when I get some money, then I'll go do what God told me to do. Back in 1987, Oral Roberts had a major situation that the media just destroyed him over. He had the school up there at Oral Roberts University, the, the, the medical school. And the whole purpose of raising up a medical school was to have medical missionaries because 50% of the world would not allow a missionary to come in, but they'd allow a medical person to come in. And they could send in a medical person to bring medical uh, you know, help and then be able to bring the gospel. But he had had the school and they had a number of years of graduating classes and not one person had gone to the mission field. And he would sit down, and they would say, Brother Roberts, we can't. We have an $80,000 student loan debt. We got $100,000. So please, let us first go work in the medical field, earn the money, pay off the debt. Then we'll go to the mission field, and nobody was going. So God dealt with Oral Roberts. This is what God told him. He said, you either fix the problem or I'm taking you home. Well, Jesus would never do that. I know, I'm reading some verses here pretty heavy. I don't believe Jesus would do that. I do. Because God's not interested in our excuses. He's interested in his kingdom. So what Oral Roberts did is he came up with an idea. He said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a way to raise up $10 million and scholarship every single one of those medical missionaries or those medical students and they have to, in order to pay, and I'll pay for their medical training, but they have to make a contract that they'll go overseas for the first four years. Come on, amen? Well, once the media got a hold of it, because he shared the whole story, the media said, oh, Robert says if God, if people don't, if he doesn't raise $10 million, God's going to kill him. That's not what happened. God said, hey, and this is what the Lord said, if you don't fix this, 
If you don't change this, I'm going to take you home because I'm done with you. Are y'all hearing me? Stop giving excuses and stop giving them an opportunity to get excuses. I called them to go to the nations and I tell them to go. Stop going back and waiting for the inheritance and waiting for the provision. Just get busy. I'm God. I can open up the windows of heaven. I can pour out manna. I can cause gold to grow out of the dirt. I am God. Just get focused. Stop giving me excuses and get busy doing what I told you to do. I'm talking to somebody here. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the unsaved do it the unsaved way. That's what he meant. Let the heathen rely upon the inheritance. You just go and do what I called you to do. Woo. Watch what it says. Let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Because let me tell you something. Money follows ministry. I'm going to help somebody here. I'm talking about three or four people, right? Come on. Money follows ministry. If you put ministry and ministering to people and building the kingdom first, don't you worry about the money. The money will follow. Wow. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says this. He who trusts in riches will fall. Let's, let's read that again. Maybe it was wrong. Somebody open the message Bible. It might be different. <laughs> he who trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Someone say, I'm going to flourish. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 through 9. Now, this is right afterwards. Immediately, in fact, immediately after he said this, Jesus then sends off the 70. So he just did these three things, and now he goes sends off the 70. Here's what he says. He says, the harvest is truly, uh, truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. But I got to have some laborers. I got to have some followers. I got to have people who are willing to be homeless if that's what it takes. They're well, let me phrase that in case some of you run out of here and say I'm saying something that I'm not saying. I don't want a bunch of homeless people in the church. You're willing to lose your comfort. Hello. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest, send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. You ever try to do ministry out there? You know that's true. And that's before you usually get out of the doors of the church. Okay. <laughs> carry, <laughs> carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals. Now watch this one. And greet no one along the road. Now that's easy for me. I'm from California. When I first moved to Texas, we'd be driving down the road. These people I don't know would wave at me. I said, what's going on? Is there a problem? Do I know you? You recognize me from TV or something? And they kept waving. Made me uncomfortable. I'm used to it now. Now I find myself, hey! <laughs> Did that in South Central Los Angeles when we were there recently. I went, hey! He went, whoa! Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, why would he say, don't even greet anybody? Don't allow yourself to be distracted by minimal insignificant conversations I'm sending you on a mission sometimes sometimes oh I'm gonna help you stop sometimes it's not being rude it's being obedient 
Sometimes you have to turn off the texting. Sometimes you have to get off the Facebook. Sometimes you have to stop just getting stumbled by the little conversations and be focused on the mission set ahead of you. I'm just saying. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. I'll preach on that sometime. That's impowerful. And if a son of peace, if someone open, is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For their labor is worthy of his wages. In other words, I'm going to send you to a place, and I'm going to send you to people that are going to receive you, and, and I'm going to use them to provide for you, and don't you worry about it. And by the way, don't you be like an American typical TV preacher and start demanding all these little special things. Well, now, if I'm going to be in your house, you've got to have this special room just set for me, and you've got to have this little piece of fruit slice. Do you know we've had this? And no, I'm telling you, you need to have this fruit, and I need you to slice it exactly in eight slices. You need to sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on it. You need to have the water exactly at 65 degrees, not too cold and not too hot. No, you think I'm kidding. We get laundry lists of all the things they got to have. Little divas walking in here. No, I'm serious. And I've literally been in the meetings where they'll come out and everything's not exactly perfect. Say, well, I can't minister under these circumstances. Yeah, well, you shouldn't be ministering at all. I'm going to send you over to Heidi Baker and have you a little discipleship. <laughs> come on, somebody, amen. We all got to have our comp. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking the things that they give you for the laborers worthy of their wages. Do not go from house to house. Don't look for a better deal. Well, I'm going to go somewhere where they like me a little bit better, where they treat me like a, I'm a prophet and apostle, and they should treat me better than this. Can't believe they gave me spam three nights in a row. Better than prison food. <laughs> Come on, man. Y'all better than that. Now, just a little caveat here. I am still open to apple pies. I'm just saying. You don't need to work to keep me extra humble, okay? Just, just Miss Ginger, just, I'm just letting you know. Next Sunday. My diet ends on Saturday. Sunday, I'm, I've been drooling for it for two months. <laughs> Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as set before you and heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Woo. But you know what I like? I didn't read this part. But then he goes and says that they don't receive you. Wipe the dust from your feet. He says, but still tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. And then the third one, Luke chapter 9, verse 61. Look at this. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but, ever say but? but. Whenever you hear a but, get ready for some stinking thinking. But, let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house, friends and family. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. How utterly rude and insensitive. Jesus, are you serious? See, true followers will have to be willing to lose everything. Be misunderstood by, by, by friends and family. Be culturally irrelevant in order to stay focused on building his kingdom. There's sometimes, now listen, we talked about here, so don't get me out of context. We talked about here about honoring father and mother and honoring parents. But sometimes you're going to have to say, no, I'm, on a, I'm going on a mission trip. I ain't going to go to the family reunion. 
No, I'm busy in prayer. I'm not going to go out and fellowship or hang out. No, I'm committed to building the kingdom of God, so I'm not going to be out fishing every other weekend. Well, I'm, yeah, oh, Lord, the Lord, Lord. Lord. I, hey, do you want to be a follower of Christ? Oh, it's quiet. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's really talking about you right now. Luke chapter 14. I'm coming in for a landing here for a moment. Y'all with me? Y'all happy? Glad you came to church? Someone say, I'm going to be a follower. Now, this is not about shaming. This is just Jesus laying it out the way it is. This is real deal. Real Christianity isn't cheap. And it isn't sugary. But it is powerful. Luke chapter 14. Whoever's on the keys, let's go. If anyone comes to me. This is Jesus talking. This is serious stuff. He does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. In other words, if he doesn't put me truly ahead of. See, we say we put him first, but in actions we don't. Come on, amen. And sometimes because we're culturally guilt-tripped into it. Right? Y'all don't have any relatives that know how to guilt trip you, do I have a few. Why do you have to be in church every week? Uh, I pastor. <laughs> and if they pull that on me, I know they pull it on you. I'm in the nation. I'm focused on the kingdom. I think about you guys first. You're my first thought. You're my first thought. You are my first thought. We, we even, 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 even when we plan vacations, you don't, know how, you don't know how much I work and labor to try to avoid missing a single service to be with you. I'm telling you, you don't know how many times we have reshuffled and reshifted things so, so we miss as few meetings as possible. Because God called me to you. Come on, amen? And nothing wrong with taking a vacation. I, I need you rested. Nothing wrong with that. But do you understand the priorities are, you, you're my priority. Come on, amen? You're my priority. You're our priority. And we, 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 people have no idea. Pastor Al can tell you how much we wrestle. And he keeps telling me, Go! And I said, I can't miss another service. I can't miss. Oh, no, no, we got this. We got that. And we, we, oh, we're in this thing. We're in that. He's just as bad. I had to kick him out a few months ago. I said, take two weeks. He looked at me. I said, two weeks. So I think you missed one Sunday, but whatever. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, verse 27, cannot be my disciple. For which of you? Now he's telling about the cost. Which of you in, intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. Isn't that what happens at the church? We get a lot of people wound up and we have a very exciting dynamic uh, environment here. And there's a lot of energy and a lot of emotion. But sometimes a lot of people come forward and make a commitment in the emotion that they didn't really count the cost. Come on, amen? And I'm not trying to make it super heavy, but Jesus kind of made it heavy. He said, listen, you going to follow me? You might die. You're going to follow me? They might take everything from you. You're going to follow me? You might be hungry and you're going to be persecuted. And you might have some challenging times. But, oh, by the way, don't worry about it. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And, lo, I am with you even to the ends of the earth. Even in the midst. Read a story the other day. Boy, you want to be stirred up. Pastor Benjamin said this last night. You want to be stirred up. Read about the fathers and, and, and mothers of the faith. And I was reading about one of those fathers of the faith. And he was overseas ministering and was being chased by a bunch of radicals hunted down to be killed and he spent the night hiding in a tree 
They couldn't see him up in the tree, but they kept running by him and shooting and randomly shooting, and he sat there. And he said, there in that tree, I had the most incredible fellowship with Jesus all night long. He said he was closer to me than any time in my life. He says, I'm just praying for another opportunity to have to hide for my life in a tree so I can go be with him. Because even though they persecute and come after me, lo, he is with me always, even to the ends of the earth. This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider what he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, verse 33, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. That's what Jesus says. See, process Christianity has sold us on a lie. It's easy. It's fast. It's cheap. And it's tasty. No, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than you wish. The price is everything. And it's not sugary. But it's God. And it's His glory. And it's His presence. And it's His power. And it's, I'm not talking about you're going to live a life in misery because when you tap a hold of this, you're going to be like the Apostle, like Apostle James who said, consider a pure joy. You're going to be like the Apostle Paul who says, I consider these light afflictions, but a momentary they're momentary. These are the, what light afflictions? Don't be beaten, shipwrecked, and stoned, and imprisoned, and hungry, and naked. But they're nothing in comparison to the glory. Someone say the glory, which is about to be revealed in us. He wasn't talking about the glory after. He was talking about glory right now. You got to get Tuesday's message. The word forsake literally means to say goodbye. <laughs> to there literally means there may be, uh, or it literally means. To forsake what one possesses. To renounce goods. And the word all there, I looked it up, and guess what all means? All. Total. Complete. With a definite article with the focus on totality. So he, he, it's not just kind of all or an American all. It's all all. So let me read that verse again. Worship people. Come on. So likewise. When whoever does not forsake every single part that he has cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Someone say, we're going to count the cost. Now, does anybody want to be a follower of Jesus? Isn't it amazing? We spend so much of our time as church leaders trying to get people to join our thing and follow us. And Jesus spent most of his time trying to tell them, you're welcome, but here's the real deal. Why don't we believe that Americans will follow? Because we don't believe that the Holy Spirit is big enough. But I believe, I believe there's a whole host of people out there who are ready to stop eating the processed Christianity and start getting a hold of the real deal and say, you know what? It's all about him. Not out of shame, guilt trip, or condemnation. Not out of some sense of performance, but out of a loyalty to him. God, where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say. What you pray, I'll pray. Wherever you go, that's where I'm going to go. Whatever you do, that's what I'm going to do. Let me give you one last verse. Amen? Are you ready? Are you getting something this morning? Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. What does it mean to be a follower? Are we willing to let go of our comforts? 
Oh, I'm not saying just dump your comforts randomly out of some martyrdom and, you know, psychology. But if that's what it takes to really follow him, then I'm going to let it go. Am I really willing to let go of my financial security? I tell you guys, I've seen many times, and I'm again, I'm not saying just go empty your bank account for some random reason because you got inspired emotionally by a message. But sometimes the call requires that. Sometimes Jesus says, just do it. Come on, amen. Just do it. And are you willing to even be misthought about and talked about by your friends and family because you're more committed to the work of the kingdom than you are to the cultural demands that are placed upon you? Jesus is saying there is a great price if you're really going to be a follower of me. Go and preach the gospel. Go and build the kingdom. Go and do the work. He's not looking for club members. He's looking for followers. He's looking for disciples. And so we need to count the cost. Not emotionally, although I love the emotion. But when we really weigh it out and say, you know what? I'm making a, I'm making a life decision. Pastor Kerry, as a child, made a life decision. Myself. When I got saved, I made a life decision. May 4th, May 4th, 1986, I made a life decision. Somehow I knew, only saved two days. I said, that's it for the rest of my life. It doesn't matter what it costs. And it has cost me greatly, but the rewards are beyond anything I could have ever imagined. The rewards here and the rewards for eternity. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. Shakara, Baba, Just pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment.